Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for developmental. In this lecture we're going to be looking at cognitive development in infancy and early childhood. The first half of that which is cognition. So in this lecture we're going to cover cognition, we're going to look at the brain, we're going to look at thinking and problem solving, and we'll finish with Piaget's stages. Now I should say before we get into this that um, the reason that the the, the semester is scheduled the way it is now is because some of these topics it's it's better to cover these topics in detail when we're still talking about the earlier stages and then we can kind of just come back and hit on them later so there's a lot of material to cover when we're talking about cognition we've got to talk about um, basic cognition then think finishing with language in early childhood and then even things that I could have included in early childhood like memory and stuff like that I push back to later so that we can talk about that so when we're looking at this some of these topics we're going to cover we're going to look at more than just this early childhood infancy type but for the most part we're going to cover that so let's first define cognition so cognition is defined as the activity of knowing and the process through which knowledge is acquired and problems are solved. So knowing, problem solving, and knowledge. Those are the three main components. Uh, and there's, there's a lot more that goes into cognition than this, but these are our three main components. So when we break it down, this is what we're going to look at. And when we're talking about development and cognition, humans are cognitive beings throughout the lifespan but cognition does change in important ways from early on. Let's start with some overviews of cognition. So we're just going to, before we even get to like development and throughout the lifespan, we have to define some things with cognition for those who haven't taken a cognitive class. So first thing, we've got some important parts of the brain. We've got four lobes. The frontal lobe, which is responsible for executive functioning, attention, problem solving, things like that. So this is the important lobe when we're talking about um, basic human cognition. You've got the temporal lobe, which is responsible for hearing, memory, and language. So that one's important as well. The occipital lobe in the back, which is responsible for vision. And then the parietal lobes, which is responsible for vision and attention. But when we're talking about a lot of things with, with human cognition, we're, we're referring more to the frontal lobe and a little bit less to the temporal lobe and the others. Why is that the, the case? Because the prefrontal cortex is part of the frontal lobe. And the prefrontal cortex is very important in human cognition because it's involved with things like problem solving, planning, high level thinking, uh, it, it is the last part of the brain to develop. It, it typically doesn't finish developing until you're in your 20s, and some are even saying now as late as 26. And it is basically what's responsible for a lot of things like risk taking and the, the analysis of risk versus reward, that type of thing. Damage to this area can involve more risk taking, things like that, but it can also revolve, uh, involve difficulty switching from one task to another. I'm not going to go into it much more than that. Uh, just note that the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that, that we look at when it comes to a lot of our higher cognitive processing. So let's look at thinking itself. So we looked at, at the definition of cognition and cognition had the how knowledge is acquired, the process, the activity of knowing. Well, let's now look at the activity of knowing, thinking itself. So we've got reasoning. This is where we draw further inferences from current knowledge and belief. And we'll look at, at some things when it comes to that. Then you've got decision making where you evaluate alternate outcomes and make a choice. Decision-making quite often has to do directly with risk-taking as well, because when you take a risk, you're, you're, you're given choices in a sense, whether you're aware of it or not, and you're, you're choosing, you're making a decision to take the risk. 
and problem solving, basically generating a way to a goal. Let's look at some of the problem solving before we get to the reasoning. So some problems are solved all of a sudden. So there's two different main types of problem solving. Some are all of a sudden. Aha experience, Eureka. Basically, you're looking at a problem and you go, oh, this is what you have to do. Um, so for instance, let's say you've got this triangle problem here. And you need to move three dots to make the triangle point down instead of up. Now, there might be uh, various different ways to do this, but one of the ways to do it, and the thing when it comes to this is you're staring at it, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it, and it's not a incremental problem where you have to solve one piece of it to get to the next piece. No, it's a insight, an aha problem, because um, you, when you're looking at it, you go, oh, aha, that's how you do it. So how you do this exact one, we're going to move this one to here. We're going to move this one to here. And we're going to move this one to here. And now we have the triangle like that. So it's you, you're, you're looking at it and all of a sudden the conclusion comes to you. The other type of problem is what's referred to as incremental problems. These are not insight problems. These are ones where you apply steps to get to the final answer. An example is here with you're in a room and there's a cork board on the wall. You have these materials. Task is to mount a candle on the cork board so it will burn without dripping wax on the floor. You're given the candles, the, the book of matches, and the push pins. So you have to think about this. Well, it needs to not drip on the floor and it needs to have it needs to be mounted on the board so if it needs to be mounted on the board and not drip on the floor then it needs something to sit in or sit on well what can we do we can take the matchbook here we can dump it out now we've got a tray that we can put the candle on you light the candle you drip a little bit in the matchbook you turn the candle over you stick it down to the tray to the tray then you take push pins and you push pin the tray to the cork board and now you've got a candle that won't, that isn't dripping on the floor. So it is a series of problems. There's other examples I give when I'm teaching cognition, uh, the whole problem of uh, the Homer Simpson problem. He's got Maggie, Santa's little helper, which is the dog, and uh, poison that, that are, are all um, basically together and he needs to get them to the other side but of a river and he's got a boat and the problem is is the boat can only hold three of the four it can't hold all four but he has to get all four to the other side uh, he can't leave uh, either with the poison and he can't leave uh, Maggie with Santa's little helper so what does he do well he has to work in such a way that actually does a reverse it actually um, gets farther from the goal to get to the goal so first he takes Maggie and Santa's little helper across um, but he can't leave Maggie and Santa's little helper together, so he brings Maggie back with him. He brings Maggie back with him, so that's getting farther away from the solution, and then he can grab the poison, and he can get the poison and Maggie's little helper across. So it's it's one of those where, and, and there's other ways to do this. Um, one is only two people can fit in at a time, but Maggie can be with Santa's little helper. Well... In that one, uh, you, you take the poison across first, uh, then come back, take Maggie or Santa's little helper across, bring the poison back so none of them is left with the poison, take Santa's little helper across, go back, get the poison, get the poison across. The point is, this incremental problem sometimes involve getting farther away from your goal. 
to eventually get to the solution. All right, let's look at two types of reasoning. And again, I'm giving you the crash course in cognition. Um, so two different types of reasoning are deductive and inductive. Deductive reasoning, where you draw logical necessary conclusions from a general set of premises. So um, you have legs, you have a seat, you have a back, you sit on it. That's your general set of principles. So you draw the logical necessary conclusion from that, that you have a chair. You deduce you have a chair from the general set of premises. Inductive reasoning is where you infer general principles or rules from specific facts. Your, your specific fact is you have a standard chair. So you should infer that it's got legs, it's got a seat, it's got a back, and you sit on it. So deductive, you go from general to, to specific. Inductive, you go from specific to general. Schemas. Schemas are um, cognitive structures that we basically organize our world through. We have schemas for just about everything in the world, including people, behaviors, um, physical objects, the way the world works. We have schemas. So schemas are a, a way to organize our cognition. So we organize our, our cognition into these schemas. And these are rules or procedures that structure organization. Um, existing schemas tend to be com systematically combined to form new and complex schemas. We also have adaptation, which is the process of adjusting the, the demands of the environment that occur through a simulation and accommodation. So we adapt our schema. What do, I, what do I mean by this? Like an example of a schema would be a chair. We have a schema for a chair. We know that chairs um, generally have legs, seat, back. You sit on them. This is general schema for chair. When I ask you, when I say the word chair, in your mind, you picture something that's going to be a prototype, but you don't need to know that. You're going to picture something that's a chair. And if I show you a picture of something that is a chair, you should understand that it's a chair because it fits your schema for chair. And the interesting thing is the schemas are flexible. Schemas adapt. Um, if I showed you a beanbag chair, you'd understand that it's a chair even though it doesn't have legs or necessarily a normal seat or a back. So that's the way we work with these, with schemas. We, we adapt them to the specifics. Specifically, the ways we do it are what's referred to as assimilation and accommodation. Assimilation first. Assimilation is where we interpret new experiences in terms of existing schemas and cognitive structures. So let's say we have a schema for dogs and a new animal that we see we even though it's maybe the first time we've ever seen a dog with three legs if we, we we fit this new animal into the schema for dogs um so we have a schema for dogs and we fit our experience with a new animal into our existing schema for dogs accommodation is where we modify existing schemas in order better to fit new experiences so we have a schema for dogs but the animal we see is larger or barks in a different way um, so we've never seen that before. It doesn't, it, our schema includes dogs that only barked so loud. We now modify our schema to incorporate this new dog. Um, the previous example I gave where it was three legs, that could be accommodation if we're modifying our schema to include dogs with three legs. But if we just accept that that's a dog, it, it fits all of our things. Um, that's a dog, so that's assimilation where we, we adapt it. And the final thing before we get to development is we'll look at heuristics. Heuristics are our best guess estimate, so schemas basically create heuristics. If, if I tell you uh, what's a chair, it's a best, you make a best guess estimate to what's a chair. Schemas, uh, heuristics, just like schemas, rely on previous experiment, experience. Yes, I can talk today. They rely on previous experience. So why are they helpful? Just like schemas, just like scripts, something once we didn't talk about, they help us save time. 
There, there's no need to look at all of the information because they save us time. When we look at the world around us, we can't process everything that's in our environment. So our heuristics and our schemas basically save us cognition time. And by saving just not only time, we're saving cognitive effort and cognitive effort burns a lot of calories. It's very resource intensive. So whenever we can, we our brains take shortcuts and heuristics are often correct. Um, our heuristic for what's a chair, it's often correct. Our heuristic for, for a way specific people are going to behave based on our previous interactions with them, like our friends. We expect our friends to behave in a certain way, our parents to behave in a certain way. We're often correct. Why are they bad? Why are they troublesome? Because first off and foremost, they are sometimes wrong. Um, so we have heuristics that, that are, are basically stereotypes. Stereotypes are heuristics. These are things that, that come from best guess estimates based on previous experience that are can be correct, but they can be wrong too. And when they're sometimes when heuristics are wrong, they're very wrong. Um, and sometimes it's good to just look at all the available data. If we're meeting someone for the first time, it's better to look at all of the information about them rather than just our first impression or maybe something salient about them like their gender or their race. So again, heuristics, they can be correct. And in general, we find that heuristics are often correct, but that doesn't mean that they're always correct because they're sometimes wrong. And that wrong can actually cause problems, especially when we look at things like stereotypes that lead to racism. Let's talk about Piaget. So we're going to basically talk about Piaget the rest of this lecture. We'll do one small thing at the end that's not Piaget, but the majority of the rest of this lecture is going to be talking about Piaget. So why do we talk about him so much? Because Piaget is one of the big cornerstones of developmental psychology. He basically through observations of naturalistic observations of his own children came to the conclusion that children of the same age often make similar kinds of mental mistakes um he often he also used a clinical method a flexible question and answer technique to discover how children think about problems where he he did research on other people's children as well but through his own children he basically came to this conclusion okay at this age they tend to make this mistake at this age they make this mistake and through that he came up with stages of development in infancy and childhood we'll talk about the good the bad the ugly of piaget at the end but we'll we're for now we are, are going to look at it and analyze what Piaget did. So Piaget found that humans progress through four invariant to him. It was there. There was no variance in it. Stages of cognitive development. The first stage is the sensory motor stage, and we're going to look at each of these stages in detail. The first stage is the sensory motor stage. This is from birth to about two years of age. The next is the pre-operational stage. This is from approximately two years of age till seven years of age. Then we've got the concrete operations, which is from seven to about 11. And finally, formal operations, which is from about 11 beyond. So we've got these four stages. And again, we're analyzing it right now in terms of what Piaget said I will show things that Piaget got wrong later, but if you remember from the video, from one of the videos from before, we, we looked at, um, I think it was last week's video, we looked at some of the stuff that Piaget got wrong already. So I, I, I'm telling you all of this with the caveat, we're looking at this right now from Piaget's perspective, but be aware he was wrong about some things. Sensory motor stage. Sensory motor stage is our first stage. This again is to remind you is from birth until about two years of age. And the sensory motor stage is all about experiencing the world through the senses and actions. So the infant is um, spending this time using 
his or her senses and movement to interact with the world to learn about the world. During this stage, babies put just about everything in their mouth that they can get their hands on that's part of using their senses to understand the world. Um, by the way, I mentioned Playmobiles before and, and the best for play, the best Playmobiles um, based on vision. Um, if you see this here, see how it's got the black and white sharp contrasts with things that move. These tend to be some of the best Playmobiles. Okay. Um, and you see there, there's a actually a string tied to the baby's foot to make the baby be able to move it. And it, it, the baby learns through, through action, through its senses and its actions, that it can move the Playmobil by moving its foot. During this time, the dominant cognitive structures are the behavioral uh, schemas that develop through coordination of sensory information and motor responses. So basically, when we go back to schemas, Schemas are being formed during this stage when the infant interacts with the world with its senses and its actions. Let's watch a video. Jean Piaget proposed a comprehensive theory of child cognitive development, identifying four major periods or stages of cognitive development. <laughs> The first of these stages, the sensory motor stage, spans the age range from birth to two years. During the sensory motor stage, infants learn to coordinate sensory information and motor activity, becoming increasingly able to act purposefully on their environments and solve problems. At the beginning of the sensory motor period, an infant's actions are confined to innate reflexes, like sucking and grasping. Soon, however, infants will begin to show what Piaget called primary circular reactions. One week old Aiden moves his hand near his mouth by chance. In the next few weeks, he will begin to try to reproduce this pleasurable experience, eventually sucking his thumb or hand purposefully. Jessapina, who is two months old, has learned that it is interesting to open and close her own hands near her face. While primary circular reactions center on a child's own body, secondary circular reactions involve making interesting things happen in the world outside one's body. By chance, six-week-old Iselin causes the toy on the side of her bouncy seat to move but quickly figures out how to keep it going. And five-month-old James, again by chance, pushes a button on his toy and causes music to play. After several attempts, he is able to make the music start again at his own discretion. <laughs> Unlike primary circular reactions, secondary circular reactions are not based on reflexes, but represent the first acquired adaptations of new behaviors. At about eight months of age, children show the first signs of planned, intentional behavior. Nine-month-old Hayden, for example, drops one toy to grasp another. Can you get a big kid this? Can you give it? Oh, you want to eat the box. You want to eat the box. No, nope, back to the number. He also figures out how to move an obstacle, the exorcaucer, to pick up a desired toy. Before this, secondary reactions were executed for their own sake. 
Now, Hayden has learned that one secondary circular reaction can be used in the service of another. Hayden now uses two previously acquired schemes in coordination to achieve a goal, dropping one toy to grasp another and moving an obstacle to retrieve a toy. Tertiary circular reactions occur between 12 and 18 months of age. At this stage, infants begin to actively experiment with the world, to do things just to see what will happen. Tess, for example, tries a number of locations for the teething ring, ending up wearing it as a bracelet. The development of object permanence is one of the more notable cognitive changes occurring during the sensory motor period. Children younger than about four months of age are unaware that objects continue to exist when they are no longer visible. Two-month-old Jessapina does not even look for the toy when it is hidden. Between four and eight months, however, infants begin to retrieve objects that are partially hidden behind a barrier, as six-month-old Anthony demonstrates. By 8 to 12 months, infants begin to show clearer signs of object concepts, consistently looking for objects when they are hidden. Under her hat. Tess, a 20-month-old, reaches right around a barrier to get to a toy, showing that she has achieved object permanence. Being able to represent objects mentally is an important cognitive change as it allows children to think about things they can't see or touch using insight and mental experimentation for solving problems instead of trial and error. Okay, to reiterate some of the stuff from that video, fantastic video on sensory motor stage. Um, the first, the, well, the, the important thing from that is object permanence. So we'll talk about this again later, but, or what the, some of the challenges to it, but basically it comes down to from about four months to eight months. So before four months, there's just no object permanence at all. From four months to eight months, it's, it's a kind of an out of sight, out of mind, where if it's out of sight, they're not really focusing on it. Um, eight to 12 months, they start to make the A not B error, um, or they're continuing to make the A not B error. So that this is basically, um, if an object is placed somewhere, and even if they see it being placed in B, in the new place, and they, you, they're t they typically find it at A, they'll still reach for A. Now there's some questions to this too, but the A not B error is where they basically are still reaching for places they already knew. By one year old, the A not, A, A not B error is overcome, but they continue to have trouble with invisible displacement, things that aren't seen. But then by 18 months, object permanence is completely mastered. Um, the infant can mentally represent an invisible action. Toy is being hidden. Conceive an object at its final location. But that being said, research now shows that, that Piaget was correct in that there's object permanence and A not B errors going on. But in actuality, there, there's some still some questions to um, the ages that Piaget denoted. So what's been actually found is by three months, infants actually appear to understand that objects have qualities that should permit them to be visible when nothing obstructs them. So for, for Piaget, it was up till about eight months and even it took them until 18 months to fully master object permanence. But it turns out infants as, as early, young as three months old 
have some concept of object permanence. And success on object permanence tasks also may be influenced by the task conditions, such as time interval. Um, if, if an infant sees something and then is immediately allowed to, then they have more object permanence. But if there's a delay, if something else enters their attention, then they've got less object permanence for it. In the A not B error I was explaining, that could actually be what is believed now is that's more of an error of muscle memory. So by this point in time, the, the um, motor cortex isn't fully integrated with, with conscious movement. It's almost all, some of it is, is happens automatically. So some of that reaching is more automatic and not where consciously directed attention is. So they'll be looking at B while reaching for A, that type of thing. Infants do improve their looking and reaching skills by about eight to 12 months that fixes that. And then by 24 months, infants can even play complex hide and seek games. Next stage is pre-operational stage. This is where symbolic capacity is the greatest cognitive strength of the preschooler, where they can refer to the past and future. Before this age, stage, they really can't. They can pretend or fantasy play. Um, they, they focus on perceptual salience, so the most obvious feature of an object or situation. What this means, though, is that preschoolers can be fooled by appearances because they focus on appearances. And they do have difficulty with tasks during the pre-operational stage that require logic. So reliance on perceptions and lack of logical thought means that cho children have difficulty with conservation. Let's watch a video on this. According to Jean Piaget, children enter the pre-operational stage of cognitive development during the preschool years. Their thinking changes dramatically in that they now have the capacity to think symbolically, using words or objects to represent something else. Sarah and Jill dress up and have a tea party. Later, they feed their doll. Four-year-old Jared pretends he is a spy kid and chooses an appropriate costume. What are you going to be? Um, a spy kid? I think you should have dinner with them. Todd and Jared show further increases in mental representation. They are engaged in what Piaget called symbolic play, clearly imagining that the blocks they are playing with are something else. In this case, a building. Is it a big building? Yeah, we're gonna go in it. I'm gonna put one on. Despite these increases in cognitive skills, the thought processes of pre-operational children result in characteristic errors in reasoning. One of the most easily observed efficiencies is the tendency to view the world only from one's own perspective, a phenomenon that Piaget termed egocentrism. Because of egocentric thinking, pre-operational children hide by covering their eyes or only parts of their bodies, believing that if they can't see the seeker, then they themselves can't be seen. Other pre-operational reasoning errors result from thinking that is intuitive rather than logical. For example, preschool children are incapable of conservation. They do not understand that certain properties of objects, such as volume or mass, do not change just because the superficial appearance of the object changes. When given two of Piaget's famous conservation tasks, Olivia, Deborah, Jacob, Christopher, and Jack, illustrate this lack of understanding. Is there the same amount in each one of those glasses? Okay, now I'm going to take this one. Right in here. Is there the same amount in each glass now? No. Which one has more? So this one has more than this one. 
I'd say if that one was bigger than a mountain smaller, that one has the most. Does that look like the same amount of Play-Doh? Each one's the same one? Okay. I'm going to go like this. So wash it down like that. Now, does that look like it's the same amount still? Which one's more? That one. This one. This one. Pre-operational children are not only tied to their perceptions, they are also unable to decenter their thinking or think about more than one aspect of a problem at a time. Their thinking also shows what Piaget called irreversibility. They are unable to reverse or mentally undo an action. The following responses to the question, why do they no longer have the same amount, illustrate these limitations in pre-operational thinking. Deborah, age three. Because it's tall. Christopher, age four and a half. Because this one's higher than this one. Jack, age five. Because this one's low and this one's tall. Olivia, age three. That one is that, that one is that one. Deborah, age three. Because it's squish. Jacob, age four. Because you smushed that one down and that one and not that one. That one has the most. As children move into the concrete operational stage of middle childhood, they are no longer fooled by appearances. So let's look at some stuff from that video, specifically the conservation issues. So because children at this age are unable to engage in decentration, meaning they can't focus on something other than the salient features, the the visual features, the ability, so they cannot focus on two or more dimensions of a problem at once. Um, so because of that, preschoolers lack re reversibility. They can't undo or reverse an action. So you dump the liquid from one glass to another, their, their mind can't process dumping it back. And pre-operational thinkers engage in static thought thought that's fixed on the end states rather than the changes that transform from one to another. Some examples of this. You saw the one with the, the glass of water here. Um, how about which row has more pennies for the next one? Obviously, there's the same amount, but kids will say that this one has more pennies, not this one, because they're more spread out. Uh, move one stick to the left or right. Are they the same length? Kids will say yes here, no here, because one's moved. You saw the one with the, the Play-Doh, but what about down here? Does a cow have the same amount of grass to eat in each of these? Yes, but not in each of these, even though the the blue is is the same. It covers the exact same amount. It's just moved around. Some other issues here with, with pre-operational is things like egocentrism, where a tendency to view the world solely from your eyes, have difficulty recognizing others' point of view. So things like um, uh, hide and seek, if, if I can't see you, you can't see me, that type of thing. Also difficulty with classification. So here is more of looking at uh, the, the way adults organize things if given a bunch of buttons and asked to organize them, um, they, they, they might not organize them in the, in the same way adults would. They might organize them based on different criteria. However, some issues with this, some challenges to Piaget. Um, children as young as three have some grasp of the concept that number remains the same even when items are rearranged. So it's it's not necessarily that they think that the number's changing, it's more of um, they, they think the question is different. It's not when you ask them which one is more, they, they, don't, they aren't necessarily thinking about which one has more pennies, which one has more space, that type of thing. Preschoolers may not be as egocentric as Piaget claimed, there's evidence to say that they're not that egocentric, that the whole I can't see you, so you can't see me isn't as 
prevalent or as pronounced as, as Piaget thought. And preschoolers do have some understanding of classification system. Um, it's just they use different classification systems than adults. Next, let's look at concrete operation stage. So concrete operation stage involves mastering the logical operations missing and pre-operational. That is basically what differentiates um, concrete from, from pre-operational. The, the only difference is, is that all of those challenges we've been talking about, decentration, um, reversibility, egocentrism, classification, all those are mastered. So concrete operations, they can decenter, use reversibility. School-aged children are less egocentric and better at recognizing the perspectives of others. And they use classification abilities much more like adults do. Uh, so let's look at a video. I love the last kid, the, 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 the one that the brainy kid in this one. In middle childhood, children show dramatic changes in their thinking, entering what Piaget called the concrete operational stage of cognitive development. During the concrete operational stage, children begin to use logical instead of intuitive perception-bound reasoning. They are no longer fooled, for example, by Piaget's classic conservation tasks. Do these two look like they're about the same amount? Okay, yeah. Okay, good. Let's smash that down. Are they still the same? Yeah. Yes. Do these two have the same amount? Yes. Yes, they still have the same amount. When these children are asked why they believe that the taller glass or the flattened Play-Doh contains the same amount, their explanations illustrate that they are now able to decenter or to think about more than one aspect of a problem at a time. They are able to follow the transformation from beginning to end and to mentally reverse the process, achieving a logical milestone that Piaget called reversibility. Just, just because this glass was poured into there, that, just because this glass was poured into there, doesn't mean that that isn't that it isn't the same amount. It might be short a drop or so, but it's still the same amount. Because just because you flatten it doesn't mean it changes. Because it's. All you did was just smash it down. It didn't change. This before was this shape. And, and just because this is flat now doesn't mean that, that it dropped mass or accumulated mass. I love that last kid with his big words. OK, so uh, there's really nothing else to talk about from concrete operations because again all it is is mastering the ones in the previous so uh, when we talked about the challenges to the previous uh, how some kids are younger that just means that concrete operations probably happens a little bit younger than than we previously viewed it as next let's talk about formal operations and then i've got two videos for this so formal operations are mental actions on ideas so this is where um, basically people think in much more abstract than a concrete way. Informal operation, operations permit systematic and scientific thinking about problems, hypothetical ideas, and abstract concepts. So it involves reasoning from general ideas or rules to specific implications or more deductive reasoning. Let's watch a couple videos here. The formal operational stage of cognitive development is reached when an adolescent begins to think abstractly and to reason hypothetically. When asked the hypothetical question, what if people had no thumbs, pre-adolescent children like Jalur and Jenny respond much differently than adolescents do. We just have four fingers and be able to write or nothing. We wouldn't be able to tell a person that they're like good and this. <laughs> and wouldn't be able to write really good. Mm. And you couldn't play um, them Leslie. Adolescents are able to mentally picture this hypothetical situation. 
contrast it with reality, and produce a variety of conclusions regarding the implications of being without thumbs. Man, I think, I think the whole world would change, kind of. I, I know a friend of mine who's a, who's a lefty, and in fifth grade we were just shooting the breeze one day, and she said, you know, the whole world's made for righties. I said, what are you talking about the whole world's made for righties? She said, well, door handles all open a certain way, uh, tables are made a certain way, desks in school are all made for righties. You'll notice that when you get in, you can prop your right arm up, but not your left one. And sort of for the next week or so, I kept my eye out, and she was right. I mean, the, the, the whole world is sort of tailored to the majority, the, the righties. Um, and so I think if we were to lose something as simple but critical as our thumb, the whole world would change. Maybe a bunch of little things, but the, all those little things would add up to something major, and I think mm -hmm. the whole world would be different. All right, that's one. Despite these new cognitive abilities, adolescents have a tendency to believe that they are invulnerable to risk. They engage in behaviors that have potential negative consequences, but don't believe the negative consequences could actually happen to them. Drinking and driving. Um, I have to say, I've done it before, and, and you know, it's not always you know, a situation where you absolutely don't have to do it. Sometimes you have to get home and, or your ass is, you know, in big, big trouble. Or, I mean, it's like, I mean, not like hammered where you can't even stand up straight. I mean, you've had about, you know, three or four beers or, you know, a, two mixed drinks or something and you need to drive. And, you know, you might feel a little tipsy, but you have to drive home because the reverse effect is far worse than what might happen to you on the road because generally you might not get into an accident but it definitely is a big risk and it's something that you know parents worry about but teenagers tend not to worry about it because it's not real in their mind until something will actually happen and one of their friends really gets hurt. Do you think people have unprotected sex? All the time. Why? <clears throat> because they say it feels better. Oh, right. But they could die, right? AIDS and stuff? I don't think they really think about that too much. Why do you think that is? Because a lot of teenagers think they're invincible. They think nothing can touch them. Why? Because they're stupid. <laughs> oh, everybody's pregnant nowadays. Oh, uh, I don't know <laughs> if anybody's like what? using condoms anymore because there's about five or six people that are walking around the school Speed that are six. sophomores and juniors that are pregnant. What? Oh yeah, what and about that? And they're I, amongst I, like a lot of, well, all of them that I know of are minorities. So yeah, I don't yeah, know if true. people like believe in using condoms anymore or what, birth control or getting a shot or something, but I guess it doesn't exist because I know three people who are pregnant. Three people who just had a baby. And three people who just had a baby who were like under the ages of 15. Who are like my class 16. are expecting. We have at least six girls in this school alone. Why do you think teenagers have unprotected sex when they know that pregnancy or STDs are possibilities or probabilities. Mm. Some guys will tell you, oh, you're gonna be my first and all this stuff, and they really lie, because you can't be myself, guy, virgin or not. And then you think that he's your only, he's gonna be your first, and if you're with the guy a very long time, you're gonna think, oh, he's true to me and stuff like that. And then they'll have unprotected sex and they're gonna be together forever and it really don't matter. And some people also get their boyfriend tested, or they both get tested. Really? And they think, oh, neither one of us have an STD. He's not cheating on me, so we'll be okay. Why would you, if you know the risk, why would you do that? Oh, because it's a little saying, oh, it won't happen to me. Like, there are people in here that have caught the diseases, and they're like, oh, I didn't think it would happen to me. But your friends have been telling you, because, like, I knew girls that were, like, going every day and, getting, and having sex when I was in seventh grade in Cambridge. They were like, oh yeah, I'm not a virgin. I haven't been a virgin since like fourth grade. Yeah, the, the ages have gotten younger. Okay, let's talk about some of those. Uh, and, and what it comes down to. So according to PSJ, the transition from concrete operations to formal operations is something that takes place gradually over years. So adolescents show an awareness of scientific reasoning, even if they're not able to produce logical scientific reasoning skills until later. Um, there, there's intuition and scientific reasoning that coexist then in older thinkers. Then as they get older with age, adolescents are increasingly able to decontextualize 
or separate prior knowledge and beliefs from the requirements of the task at hand. And finally, the achievement of formal operations thinking depends on opportunities to learn scientific reasoning through exposure. So through exposure, a lot of what it comes down to is exposure. Exposure to math and science education really shape formal operations. So, and you, you might be asking yourself at this point, why are we talking about this? We're supposed to be talking about infancy and early childhood. It's because when we're talking about Piaget stages, we basically have to talk about them continuing through because they build on each other. If I wait now two, three weeks to talk about formal operations, it's not going to be as salient as talking about it right now. So adolescents also have egocentrism. But adolescent egocentrism is unlike the egocentrism in earlier kids where it's, I can't see you, you can't see me. It, in adolescence, it's more the imaginary audience where this is this phenomenon of confusing one's own thoughts with those of the audience for your behavior. Um, it, it's characterized by strong self-consciousness. What do I mean by this? The imaginary audience is where you think everybody's looking at you, that type of thing, where, where um, where if you've got something wrong with you that everybody's noticed it and is talking about it the truth of the matter is though is all adolescents have this going on they're all self-conscious and worried about everybody looking at them and talking about them and they're spending so much time doing this that they're not really looking at or talking about other people as much so this imaginary audience is kind of it's it's in some ways the opposite because everybody's so self-centered at this point that they don't even really notice things from other people. Now things are noticed and things are talked about, but definitely nowhere near as bad to the extent that people, adolescents believe. The other is the personal fable. Tend to think that your thoughts are are unique, um, that that your the kid is invincible, things like that. Um, this is where the, the Superman, the illusion of invincibility um, type of thing comes from. Um, adolescents think that they're, they're, they're unique, that what they're thinking, no one's ever thought, what they're going through, no one's ever gone through. Well, in actuality, there is no special little snowflakes, that anything that, that an adolescent is thinking has been thought before, anything that an adolescent is feeling has been felt before actually by a lot of people. Let's look at some of the limitations of this stage. So research has actually revealed limitations in, in uh, adult cognitive performance. Only about half of college students actually show firm and consistent mastery of formal operation stage, something that's supposed to be 11 to 14 years old mastered definitely by, by high school. It, they're starting to show that actually only about half of college students can consistent show consistent mastery of formal operations in reasoning tasks many american adults don't do not solve scientific problems at a formal level i mean I, I we could probably see this with the way the world is going right now and there are some societies in which no adults solve formal operational problems especially like hunter-gatherer societies in actuality Adults are, are likely to only use formal operations in a field of expertise, then use concrete operations in unfamiliar problems. So even people who have PhDs, they, they solve stuff in their, their field with formal operations, but if it's something they don't have experience with, they actually use concrete operations. Let's look at beyond formal operations. So beyond formal operations, theorists have actually proposed two forms of post-formal thought in ways we think, and these are more on the philosophical level, how you think philosophically rather than how you think scientifically. The first is relativistic thinking. This is understanding that knowledge depends on its contact context and the subjective perspective of the knower knowing that that knowledge can change if the situation changes the other is dialectical thinking which is where detecting paradoxes and, and inconsistency among ideas and trying to reconcile them 
this is more of the side looking at um, understanding that that you can have a belief that has contradictions in it or you can un view something that has contradictions in it and being able to rec reconcile those contradictions. So finishing up with Piaget, the good, the theory has stimulated a lot of research and it continues to guide the study of human development. It's basically at the basic, the core of human development is Piaget's stages. Piaget showed us that infants are active in their own development. Before this, it was thought that, that development just happened to infants. Now we know that infants are acti actually active in their development. Piaget showed us that infants and children think differently at each stage of development. And this is something that kind of prior to this, it was um, just believed that, that children were small adults. And he showed that no, they actually think differently. And Piaget's account of the direction of cognitive development, the sequence was basically correct. Um, even though there are other factors like cultural factors that can influence this. We talk about the good, we've got to talk about the bad. So the bad is Piaget seems to have underestimated the cognitive abilities of young minds. Children master concepts much younger than Piaget thought. He failed to distinguish between competence and performance. So a child may be able to understand something even if they can't actually perform on it. This is where the A not B task they might understand that the thing is at the B, but their performance is reaching for A. Piaget wrongly claimed that broad stages of development exist. In actuality, these four stages are not stages. It's a continuous thing that occurs. There isn't these stages necessarily. It's more of during these time periods, children are more likely to, to be having these errors and have mastered these tasks, stuff like that. But there's no real broad stages. It isn't when you switch from one stage to another, you've mastered all the tasks of one and you just mastered them all at the same time. No, it's a gradual thing that happens over time. One of the big problems with Piaget is he gave inadequate attention to social influences upon cognitive development. His was basically in a vacuum, that the, it was all about cognitive, that it didn't, that social didn't play a big effect factor. One of the problem, one of the reasons for this here in the problems is, is that Piaget, um, upper middle class, white male, was studying upper middle class white children. The research subjects he had, upper middle class white children. So his, his attention was on that. And it turns out that social and cultural influences play a much bigger role and can change a lot of this. And because of this, he didn't account for variability in children's performances. So when we talk about Piaget, we got to talk about Vygotsky. Vygotsky took Piaget's stages, Piaget's knowledge, Piaget's research and said, something needs to be added. And that is social and cultural needs to be included. So Piaget's, or not Piaget's, Vygotsky's social cultural perspective basically said that knowledge depends on our social experiences. So cognitive development, it varies from society to society depending on things like language and culture and what is emphasized and what is not emphasized and, and what children are taught. And children acquire these mental tools through interaction with their parents and other more experienced members of society in a form of scaffolding. He actually looked at children as basically apprentices. They're learning to be adults by, by interacting with parents and other experienced members of society. And they, they adopt the language and the knowledge based on this. And that'll get us into the next set of slides, which is on language. But we've talked about kids. We talked about adolescence some, so we'll, we'll have less to talk about when we get to cognition with adolescence. But so this is basically the, the path that we've looked at with development. We've looked at Piaget. He said there's these stages, there's these challenges. Uh, Vygotsky came in and said society and culture really matter and shape these developmental outcomes. So in conclusion, we talked about Cognition, we looked at the brain a little bit, we looked at thinking and problem solving, 
And we finish with Piaget stages and then into Vygotsky's social cultural perspective. Thanks. Come on back.